Hello and welcome to our webinar presentation today. I am Catherine Macchiarola, your host today, along with Edgar Chamorro at the controls. Today's webinar is entitled The Science Behind Nanobubbles, an introduction, brought to you jointly by Moliere and Malvern Panalytico. Our speakers today are Dr. Sohail Akhtar and Dr. Ruggi Rageb. Sohail is the Vice President of Research and Development at Moliere, leading a team of experts researching nanobubble science and new applications of Moliere's technology. Sohail came to Moliere with over 20 years in leading global research and development teams. Prior to Moliere, Sohail was the head of R&D and innovation for DECO, a UPL company, the global leader in decay, sanitation, and freshness management solutions for the post-harvest fruit and vegetable industry. Before DECO, Sohail was with Avery Dennison, where he led the creation of their Global Innovation Center. So Hale has a PhD in chemical engineering from Northwestern University and an MBA from the University of Louisville. Dr. Ruby Regeb is an application scientist with Melbourne Panalytical, specializing in a number of light scattering technologies and GPC SEC product lines. Ruggie received his PhD in macromolecular science and engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University and completed his postdoctoral work in biomedical engineering at Yale University. His research focused on the fabrication and characterization of various synthetic polymers and metal-based nanoparticle systems for theranostic and drug delivery applications. Now, before we begin, I'd like to welcome you and explain some of the interactive features we will be using today. Please know that your questions are welcomed and encouraged. In order to ask the questions, please use the Ask the Speaker section to your right. And um, you can type in a question and you can also choose to ask the questions anonymously by checking the box. Simply type, type your question in and send it. We will have a question and answer session after the presentations. Um, we are recording this web seminar and it will be posted in our on-demand content area of our web website located under the Learn tab. And now I'd like to talk to our speakers and welcome them. Hello, Ruggie and Sohail. How are you today? Good, Kathy. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Great. Would you mind giving a summary of what we'll see today? Uh, I, yes. <clears throat> so today, uh, you know, I hope to give you an overview of the fascinating world of nanobubbles. You know, what they are, what properties they have, and how they work. Okay, and hopefully it'll, it'll be a great journey for us. And we and we'll be also talking about how we can characterize those nanobubbles with technologies that Melbourne Palatical has and how we can further explore their different characteristics. All right, sounds great. Well, so Hale, you are set to begin. Okay, so let me go to the presentation mode here. Uh, yes, uh, so nanobubbles are actually finding uh, a lot of great uses in, in many, many different industries, okay? So I have a few examples here, you know, irrigation, surface water, wastewater, oil and gas mining. These are areas in which Molaire is actually advancing the science and applications of nanobubbles, okay? Now, this is only a small list because you could really go triple, quadruple, okay, the number of applications and the list won't end the science and applications are advancing that fast. So, and in each of these areas, for example, in irrigation, the thing that was observed was using nanobubble water, you can get more yield, healthier crops, less pathogens, and better yield of the crops. In surface water, algae control without using chemicals. In aquaculture, you know, better fish growth uh, using oxygen utilization. And in wastewater, some amazing effects, okay, have been seen. Uh, with the quality of the water and also how the oxygen is utilized by the microbes uh, during the wastewater treatment process, okay? And there's a lot of other things being developed in oil and gas and mining, which uh, in due course, you know, we will all hear. But the idea here is that nanobubbles are finding uh, great use in, uh, in a lot of different industries, okay? So in this here, so all those benefits I mentioned to you in the earlier slide, those benefits are made possible by a huge number of, you know, properties, really very fascinating properties that nanobubbles have. Some of these are mentioned here. Not only they're small, but they have a charged surface, okay? And that charged surface is able to do a lot of chemistry. It's able to do electrochemistry, and it also has oxidative ability, okay? 
given enough, you know, OH ions and oxygen ions, oxygen molecules in there, these, it's able to do oxidation reactions, okay? And the bubbles themselves, it has been shown to reduce surface tension of water, okay? Uh, it has uh, been shown to reduce the uh, pH of water, okay? And it's very stable. It stays there for a very long time. Uh, it's neutrally buoyant. And because of these properties, it hangs around. And then it has the ability to do all these different effects. It creates all these effects uh, in water or any liquid, okay? So what are these nanobubbles, okay? So nanobubbles is a generic term. Uh, basically, anything around 100 nanometers. We, we say in Molaire, we actually say anything below 200 nanometer size. We kind of classify it as a nano nano bubble. Okay, but officially, anything below one micron size is called ultrafine bubbles, and nano bubbles would be like a subset of this ultra ultrafine bubble classification. Okay, so as you can see, they're very small. Here's a comparison against a grain of salt and against a water molecule. Uh, it's even like on the size of the viruses. Okay, so extremely small. Okay. So nanobubbles, uh, you know, historically, the way it started, first surface nanobubbles were discovered. So these are bubbles which are kind of stuck on a surface. And this was first observed, I believe, in the semiconductor industry, where people saw this and they were wondering what it is. And finally, from there, the science developed. And these were recognized as, you know, these nanobubbles sticking to a surface. And later on, these bulk nanobubbles were worked on and their existence was demonstrated. So today, we think of nanobubbles in two forms, in a stuck to a surface or stable in a bulk, okay? So this is the way uh, I, I think these things exist, and this is how we think about it, okay? So what are nanobubbles, right? Then the next question is, uh, how are they made, okay? So here, we have kind of captured, you know, four generic methods, but there are other methods, okay, that you may be aware of, okay? And they have their own benefits and, uh, you know, uh, drawbacks. Some of the popular ones are cavitation, the very first one that you see. Uh, you can also use electrical, um, electrical excitation methods of generating nanobubbles. Shear is another popular one, which Moller actually uses as part of the many other methods. We use uh, shear also. And then there is this solvent mixing method. And there are others, Okay. So now the, the thing to remember here is that each of these methods have their pros and cons. Some methods like shear methods are highly scalable. You can go from very low volume to very high volumes of liquid and the method would still be valid. In some other methods, they're limited. Either they're not scalable or the amount of bubbles you can make or the size of bubbles you can make, you know, they could be limited, okay? So here the message is you pick your method based on your application okay what works for you if nanobubbles is what works for you then you have to use certain methods okay if micro bubbles micro bubbles are like sizes of microns if these are the ones you're interested in then you use other methods Cav cavitation venturi method is one method where you can actually create a lot of so-called micro bubbles okay so this method, number of methods are proliferating. Okay, a lot of people are developing all kinds of methods and there are also combination methods that have been developed, okay? So this whole world of nanobubbles is getting very rich in the way you produce the bubbles, okay? But in the end, when you come to applications, you have to look at the pros and cons. So what works best for a certain kind of application, okay? All right, uh, so... So next slide shows, you know, a picture of the Moller's nanobubble technology. This is the original technology we developed. It's called the shear method. So basically what happens is you push gas through a membrane over which there's a liquid flow. Liquid flow provides the shearing force. Okay. And then the bubbles are basically entrained in the liquid. And then the whole mass of liquid then would go into a container. Okay where you can actually collect this nanobubble. So you can keep recycling and you can make more and more, okay? So here what happens is the gas that's introduced in the water is of two kind, two states. One is dissolved. These are molecular level gases dissolved in the liquid. 
And then there's gas which exists in the nanobubble. So gas in the nanobubbles and gas in the bulk of the liquid, which is the dissolved state. Okay. So these are the two forms of gases that uh, we would inject uh, using uh, using this method or actually any method. All right. Uh, so here only uh, the point I would like to point out is I mentioned the scalability. This kind of method is scalable, um, you know, all the way from very low, like 10 gallons per minute to 7,000, 10,000 gallons per minute, which is a range that Molaire covers, okay? And the technology seems very, very scalable. And the number of bubbles you can produce is also, you can vary them quite a bit from millions to hundreds of millions, okay? So when you make these nanobubbles, how do you view them? How do you look at them? So we kind of think of it in two ways, a qualitative method and a quantitative method. So in the qualitative method, what we would use is a green laser, a laser pen, and you basically shine it you know, through the liquid. And then you kind of see like a fluorescence, you kind of see a light scattering. And the stronger it is, the light scattering, uh, the higher the bubble population. So here you see an example going from deionized water to 300 million to 600 million uh, bubbles. And you can see how the light intensity, the, uh, the reflected or the scattered light, uh, you see how the intensity of that increases as you go to higher and higher nanobubbles, okay? So this is, uh, a, this, this is a, gonna, I'm gonna turn on the video on. You can see how intense that light is. On the left-hand side is DI water. On the right hand side is the water with the nanobubbles. Okay. And this is a qualitative way, a great quality, a quick way of saying, okay, finding out did I make anything or not? Okay. And this, uh, we use it very extensively <clears throat> when, we, <clears throat> when we generate bubbles to see if they are in there or not. Okay. Going to the next slide. So there's this quantitative method. Okay. So Malvern has some instruments which we use, which is basically de facto, is the standard, <clears throat> the standard equipment to use when you're working with nanobubbles. So this nanocyte equipment is the equipment which kind of tells you uh, the size of the nanobubbles, what size you made, and also it tells you the number, the density, how many millions of bubbles you made, okay? And you see these two pictograms at the bottom <clears throat> showing image of a control which would be like a DI water or a tap water. And then the image where it shows a lot of bubbles, which would be the liquid water containing the nanobubbles, okay? And then a zeta sizer is another very useful equipment to measure the zeta potential, which again is a very basic characteristic of the nanobubbles, okay? So these two methods, these two equipment are, are kind of like the standard in the industry now uh, in terms of uh, uh, when you work with nanobubbles. Okay, uh, so Ra Raghi, I'll, I'll kind of let you take over uh, from, from here. Thank you, Sohail. And uh, again, thank you again for everyone's uh, time and attention. We'll start by looking at nanocyte nanoparticle tracking analysis as the technique. And so if we look at the different parameters that are offered by nanocyte or an NTA, we start off by looking at the size range. So we can look at the minimum size range for uh, particles analyzed by nanocyte would be around 10 to 40 nanom nanometers, with nanobubbles being really more specifically around the 30 to 40 nanometer mark. Um, if you are spiking your, your nanobubbles solution with metals and metal oxides for some reason, then you can push that lower limit to that 10 or 15 nanometer mark. Um, the upper range is more, uh, about 2000 nanometers. It has to do with anything that's gonna retard the Brownian motion of your particles um, as they move in solution. And so whether it's the size of the actual particle or if it's the viscosity of the solvent, then any of those effects will, will dictate the upper limit, upper size limit. The other parameter that is offered by nanocyte is particle by particle analysis. It's looking at the particle concentration or net number uh, of, of nanobubbles. And so the minimum concentration that you can analyze is 10 to the sixth particles per mil. 
that simply has to do with statistics. There are ways to um, account for pretty dilute samples. You can record longer videos. You can give more time for um, uh, statistical data points to be collected um, to give you better re reliability. And then the upper concentration limit is going to be 10 to the 10th particles per mil. And that has to do with being able to correctly and, and accurately measure each individual particle as it moves in Brownian motion um, in the field of view. The other parameter to appreciate is that nanosite does do, present particle by particle analysis. And so what that presents is this advantage of being able to analyze very polydispersed samples. So you can distinguish you know, one sample from another um, by a 1.2 to one resolving ratio. What does that mean? That means that you can distinguish, let's say 120 nanometer particle from 100 nanometer particle uh, and so forth. So you can see that we can look at very high resolution uh, information. And on top of that, because it's a particle by particle analysis, you can gate on you know, certain sub ranges and get percentages and uh, concentrations of a sub range in comparison to the total population. We can look at relative light intensity. Um, so if you are looking at nanobubbles in the presence of let's say metals and metal oxides that are of the same size, we can go back and look at the relative uh, light intensity of those two populations and gate around one versus the other. And then um, the other aspect or uh, parameter that nanocyte offers is the ability to measure fluorescence. So you can have a choice of four different laser modules um, and then choose the corresponding long pass filter and then look at fluorescently labeled particles and then uh, compare them to the total population and um, do that profile comparison. So I alluded to some of this already, but the premise behind nanocyte is that you would first visualize the particles by recording a video. And then so you would then process that video and you can see the red random walk of Brownian motion of those particles moving in suspension. And then we take that analysis and we produce the final data, which here in this case, we're showing the concentration versus size plot. And again, we're looking at the properties of these light scatterings, a light scattering of, of particles um, and their Brownian motion to obtain the particle size distribution in the liquid suspension. So what, how do we actually obtain the data? What we're doing is we're looking at the light scattered from the particles, not the particles directly, but the light scattered from the particles moving at Brownian motion. And so we can, we can look at how fast they move and distinguish their, their size based on that movement. So Brownian motion dictates that smaller particles move faster, larger particles will move slower. And all the analysis that you, that you do with nanocyte happens on the order of minutes. It's not a very long process. You can do multiple videos, um, record the Brownian motion of several videos of the same sample all within a matter of minutes. And when we look at the, the construct, what we see here is we have a laser module that has a diode laser that sits at an angle. And that laser beam goes through this prism and then it's the prism scatters the beam into a suspension of particles. And we, the particles in themselves will scatter light and we see the light with a high sensitivity Hamamatsu scientific CMOS camera, a 20X objective lens. And it looks down at the field of view and it notes the light scattered off the particles moving in Brownian motion. And it's important to note that the resolution of the camera, the magnification of the uh, objective lens and the laser power gives you the most economical combination to directly measure the Brownian motion of each particle. We're not extrapolating any data. This is direct measurements for the full size range that we offer. 
And so what we do is we use the mean square displacement of those particles on a frame by frame basis. And we utilize the Stokes Einstein equation, a version of it that we that you see here, to translate that mean square displacement of the particle on a frame by frame basis to the hydrodynamic diameter. And you can see that the equations account for temperature and viscosity. Temperature, there's a temperature probe right at the prism inside the laser module to always monitor the temperature and account for that in the size calculation. And then the viscosity, you would simply input that. In the field of nanobubbles, you are assuming the viscosity to be that of water. There are lots of other um, fields of, of in, in industry where you might be working with organic solvents or other solutions that might have a viscosity other than water. And then you would input that known viscosity value in the software. So there is no need to calibrate your method. Um, the, sample, the analysis is pretty straightforward. And if you look at the actual little cartoon here, you see there's two numbers next to the Brownian motion track. The top number is the size of that particular particle. And the bottom number is the number of frames that particle was trapped. At, the Hamamatsu camera takes 25 frames per second. And we only need to see the particle for about five or six frames, so about a fifth of a second, before it's counted towards the distribution report. So the analysis is pretty straightforward, but it's also very robust, collecting a lot of data points in a short period of time. So we talked about how we measure size. Concentration is measured by looking at the number of particles on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. And so when the camera takes 25 frames per second, that means if you were to record a 30 second video, that would translate to about 700 or so uh, uh, frames. And it calculates the concentration by noting the number of particles it sees in a 2D field of view. It extrapolates to a known third dimension and it calculates that concentration on that frame by frame basis. So that 30 second video would have 700 something frames or that many averages of concentration. So by the time you record a 30 second video, you get a pretty absolute number average um, for a concentration in terms of particles per mil. And then as I mentioned, we can look at fluorescence. Oftentimes people who are looking at fluorescence might, you know, in the field of nanobubbles might be looking at other um, live moieties in, in, uh, you know, in the presence of your nanobubbles in the water. People could be looking at fluorescently labeled viruses or bacteria. And again, it's the same premise where you're doing the same analysis, but this time you're simply inserting a filter, doing uh, and then recording the same video, uh, same process, but now you're just looking at a subpopulation that is fluorescently labeled and comparing it to the total population. So that is the premise behind how nanosite works. And as Sohail mentioned, the other product that is often used for nanobubble analysis is the Zetasizer. Now the Zetasizer has been known well around the world for years and years as both a dynamic light scattering instrument for measuring size, and electrophoretic light scattering instrument for measuring zeta potential. And what I'll do today is I'll focus on the electrophoretic light scattering. If you would like to learn more about how Zetasizer can measure their size, please come talk to me afterwards or reach out to a number of resources that we will offer. But let's look at electrophoretic light scattering. So what is it and how does it work? What we're doing is we're looking at a frequency shift of the scattered light from particles that are undergoing electrophoresis. Um, and we're using that to determine the charge that they have in a particular dispersant, meaning we're looking at their zeta potential. So plainly put, what we're doing is we're looking at the response of particles moving in Brownian motion to an applied electric field as they res you know, respond to different electrodes. And so the premise behind it is you look at electrophoretic mobility, which further translates to the zeta potential, 
through something called the Henry equation. And the electrophoretic mobility is calculated by noting the particle velocity and the electric field strength. So if we parse that out and look at the electric field strength, that is calculated by looking at the applied voltage um, across electrodes in a cuvette and the distance between those electrodes. The particle velocity, um, and I should mention that the zeta potential at the end of the day is a metric for colloidal stability of your sample. And the, more, the higher the absolute value for zeta potential, the, the more colloidally stable your sample is. You can see that the high zeta potential value, whether it's negative or positive, indicates that you have a stable population, whereas a low zeta potential value indicates you have an unstable population, something that might be a um, thing to aggregate or crash out. But to go back to the electrophoretic mobility equation, we have the electrofield strength, which we defined, and now we have the particle velocity. And the particle velocity is determined by the laser Doppler effect, where we're looking at a shift in frequencies between a reference beam that would go through, uh, that, that would just, uh, a, a reference beam, and then a beam going through the sample. The, the beam going through the sample would develop a different frequency than the reference beam. And now you see the shift in that reference, uh, in that frequency, and we use this equation to calculate the particle velocity, where we know the laser wavelength. It's a, a 633 helium neon laser um, that's manufactured in the instrument, or manufactured as, as part of the instrument, and the scattering angle um, that we use to measure the zeta potential. So we can then solve for the particle velocity, which goes back to our equation for electrophoretic mobility, and that enables us to calculate that value. So let's take a step back and actually make sure we understand what zeta potential is. Because sometimes there's a misconception saying, oh, it's the charge on the surface of my particle. Well, it's more about the electrostatic interaction between the valent charges around your particle, namely the slipping charges that are in the slipping plane uh, around your particle, or your nanobubble in this case, and the solvents. And so that interaction, that electrostatic interaction can be dictated by a number of factors. And that could be the pH, the total ionic strength, the co concentration of specific anions or concentration of specific cations or electrolytes. And we can present the data in two different ways. There's something called a fast field reversal, which looks at the overall electro electrophoretic mobility of your particle, of your nanobubbles, um, and subtracts out any electroosmotic mobility of the solvent or of the, of the water itself. And that would give you the overall zeta potential value. And then there's slow field reversal would, that would enable you to get a zeta potential distribution. And that accounts for both electroosmotic mobility of your dispersant, your solvent, and the electrophoretic mobility of your particles. So with that, I will end my uh, piece here and I give the presentation back to Sohail. So this was done actually uh, kind of um, early in the history of our company where we had an equipment and we wanted to see, you know, how much nanobubbles are we making, what size we are making. So we went to actually an independent third party lab which already had the Malvern equipment, okay? So in this graph, you can see the population uh, of the bubbles and the size of the bubble. So this was, uh, you know, confirmation by a third party, uh, basically saying that, uh, you know, the nanobubbles we are making is of the right order of magnitude in terms of population and also about the right size, okay? And this kind of curve is actually very typical. Actually, anybody who generates nanobubbles sees a curve like this, kind of centered around 100, you know, minus something, plus something, but in that region, okay? So this is how we kind of quantitatively confirm uh, that uh, the method is working, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm on the next slide, uh, Ragi, slide 27, okay? So, so you might, so by the way, I saw a lot of questions on the, uh, on the sidebar. 
so hopefully you will get your answers in the, in the, in these slides that I'll be discussing. But if not, please forward your questions to the moderator, and then we can answer it um, on a one by one basis. Okay. So, so when you have the uh, so I had mentioned before uh, when you have gases in a liquid, they're in two form, two states. One is dissolved, and one is inside the nanobubbles, right? Gas inside the nanobubble. So you might wonder how much gas is in the nanobubble compared to how much is in the bulk of the liquid. Okay. So you can actually do a very simple calculation. For example, you can assume a size of 100 nanometers. You can assume a population of 100 million bubbles per milliliter. And using the gas law, you can actually figure out how much gas, okay, how many molecules or how many grams of gas is in the nanobubbles, okay? And it turns out that it's not much. Compared to the gas that's dissolved from, for example, oxygen, the normal solubility is about 8 or 10 at room temperature, normal conditions, 8 to 10 ppm. Now, but the gas with 100 million bubbles, okay, per milliliter, the amount of oxygen in the bubble is actually very, very small. So this is kind of a uh, surprising, uh, you know, feature uh, that the amount contained in the nanobubbles is actually very small. The numbers are very big, 100 million. Uh, but the amount in the nanobubbles is very small, okay? So then you might wonder, you know, so what the heck, uh, how does it work? You know, it's such a small amount of gas in the nanobubble. So in the following slides, I'll keep pointing out why they work, what they do, and that's the fascinating part of nanobubbles, okay? So next slide, uh, slide number 28. <clears throat> so bubble is a bubble. Inside is gas. It's under pressure, Okay. Then you, you might wonder, you know, why is it stable? Why doesn't it just, you know, explode away, okay? So here, what I'm showing you that the internal pressure is basically balanced by the surface tension at the surface, okay? Plus there's a charge at the surface, which actually uh, affects the total energy of the system. So, the, so if you can think of arrows, you know, pressure this way and surface tension and surface charge this way. And those two are in balance, okay? And that's how the system uh, kind of stays uh, stable, okay? So here there's a little twist. Uh, if you use the traditional classic uh, Young-Laplace equation, the pressure difference between the inside of the bubble and outside of the bubble actually is very large. It's almost like 28, 30 bars, you know, 400 PSI kind of quantity which is kind of mind boggling that there's so much pressure in the inside the uh, inside the bubble. OK, but that's the way it is. OK, the, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've seen a method, experimental method to actually measure the pressure inside the bubble. But maybe one day there will be. OK, so these estimates are basically calculations, basically saying that if you use the young Laplace equation, then it predicts a pressure of this much inside the bubble. OK. But because of the surface charge, there are later modifications were done to the to this model that the surface charge also contributes. Okay, there's a repulsive energy, and you have to take that into account to calculate so-called the true pressure inside the bubble. Okay, so there's some debate about this about this, but the best way to think about this is there's something different. Okay, it's not like a normal soap bubble. There's something different about these nano bubbles. Okay. And exactly what is the pressure inside the bubble could be a matter of debate. But there are theoretical guidelines you can think of, you know, why the pressure should be or should not be of a certain amount. Okay. I'll come to the charge, you know, minus a positive. I, I think I saw a question <clears throat> posted. I'll come to that later on. So I'm going to the next slide, which is slide number 29. So here uh, we, we say, you know, these nanobubbles are stable, meaning... Uh, they're stable in the liquid. They don't just float up, okay? And the reason they don't float up is because of the size. When it becomes that small, then any motion in the fluid, thermal motion, you know, bumping action, if this is my bubble, you know, the molecules come bumping it, it goes this way, but then other molecules come bump this way, it goes this way. So the bubble has no net directional movement, Okay. It's just being bounced around in a random motion uh, everywhere, uh, which is known as Brownian motion. And this Brownian motion dominates at that size, size below one micron. 
brown in motion dominates that's why you don't get a net floating up okay for for bigger sizes yes net flow up and then they would disappear okay so this is a very uh, classic behavior of nanoparticles and a very useful because it allows it to hang around stay around and do whatever it has to do okay <clears throat> so going to the next slide slide 30 so slide 30 is a great slide Okay, if you want to take away any slide, take this slide, okay, and maybe one more. So here, uh, hopefully this will answer some of the questions I saw. So the way we kind of view the bubble, uh, if you look at the uh, picture at the bottom, there's a gas bubble, and then there are adsorbed negative charges. And here we show OH minus, okay, and that's the origin why uh, in normal conditions in water, let's say clean water, why there is negative charge. It's almost universal. You always get negative charge in clean water. And, 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 and the theory, the belief, and there's experimental evidence that the uh, boundary, the surface of the bubble adsorbs this OH minus, okay, ions. Okay, so they're all around the bubble surface, okay? And that is your origin of your negative charge, okay? Then you say, okay, what happened to the positive? Electrically, everything is neutral. So these positive ions, the hydronium ions and other positive ions, they are further out. They are in what we call the cloud, okay? So we got very localized negative charges and out in the open, you have this mobile uh, positive charges floating around, okay? So if you think of this picture, actually it explains a lot of things. So number one, of course, it explains the negative charge, why there's this negative charge on the, on the surface. But it also explains the micro environment. Okay, we talk about pH. Okay, so if you think about the uh, about the liquid which is way out, further out, we which have an excess of hydronium ions now. Okay, and as you know, hydronium ions the pH should be lower. Okay, so if I if I think of a theoretical probe going from from the bulk of the liquid towards the bubble. I'm going to encounter a very different environments. First of all, I'm going to see all these hydronium ions at the outside, pH is, you know, uh, pH is below 7, for example. And then as I go inward, as I go inward, oh, the things start turning negative and negative. Now I'm dominated by a negative uh, sphere of negative charges, okay? So this is very critical to understand. I mean, you're thinking of nanobubbles is activity, it's a reactivity, this picture tells you why it behaves in a certain way, why it has an electrical charge and why it responds to electrical environment, okay? And the other thing, you know, this thing explains very nicely is, uh, is the effect of salts, okay? So, for example, if I put salts and all, let's say, sodium salts and stuff in the, in the liquid, what it does is start shielding the positive charges, start shielding the negative charge that's already built up on the surface. So what happens is this thick layer that you see, the thick layer, um, uh, there's a slip plane, okay? And then uh, and the, between the slip plane and the bubble surface, there's this concentrated charges. So that is, uh, as I increase my positive charge in the liquid, in the outside liquid, that becomes thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner, okay? which means uh, my, my zeta potential as I increase uh, my uh, positive charges starts going lower and lower and lower, okay? And ultimately, if I'm brave enough, if I put the right ions in the liquid, I could actually flip the charge, the OH charge, I can replace it with positive charges, okay? So as I said, the negative charge is typical, normal circumstances, but you actually force the system to flip the charge. The negative becomes positive. Okay, but you have to do some work. You have to add some chemicals and stuff like that to be able to do that. But the normal, but the normal environment is it is negatively charged automatically, and the and and the zeta potential is high. Okay, and uh, if I increase my salt strength, I could start reducing my zeta potential, which then reduces your stability. Okay, if I bring my zeta, zeta potential negative, let's say thirty to zero. Now my bubbles can come closer and closer together and they can merge and coalesce, okay? So that is one, uh, one uh, mechanism 
by which bubbles, nanobubbles can disappear. The stability, you can lose stability because you lost the zeta potential, okay? Conversely, if I'm in a high pH environment, pH 9, 10, 11, whatever, which are dominated by OH ions, those OH ions reinforce the charge, negative charge on the bubble surface, okay? And then it increases the zeta potential. The particles want to stay away from each other and the, and, the, and, and the stability, we say the stability is high, okay? So hopefully with this, uh, through this pictogram, I was able to explain to you why it is an equilibrium charge, why it is stable, and why salt effects can happen, okay? And why it may not be stable because you destroy that uh, charges uh, which are keeping the bubbles apart, okay? So this slide is again a great slide. Uh, because it tells you that nanobubbles can do chemistry. You can do chemistry with nanobubbles, okay? You, you remember all the charges I said, you can have you know, negative charges, you can even have positive charges on the bubbles. Now those charges can attract polarized molecules or even hydrophobic, what we call hydrophobic molecules, even those can absorb on the surface of your bubble. So now your nanobubble now becomes like a carrier. It's now like a vehicle, okay? You can carry all this stuff that's absorbed on the bubble. You can carry them, you can precipitate them, you can take them out of the system. Or you can even do chemistry in situ. So if you are somehow able to explode, okay, the bubble, okay, by suitable energetic method using a UV light, using sonication or rapid pressure changes, what happens? The bubbles do explode. You can destroy the bubbles. And in this moment of explosion, what happens is you generate radicals. You call it ROS, reactive oxygenated species. You know, it could be OH dot, OH minus. It could be some other oxygen species, O2 minus and stuff like that. And these exist for a fleeting moment, a very, very short timeline, but it does. And in, within that time space, it can do chemistry. It can destroy molecules. It can oxidize molecules. It can break down molecules, Okay. So nanobubbles, by the virtue of being being charged, uh, they can be carriers, okay? They can remove stuff from the liquid solution, as well as you can do oxidation reactions, okay? Under the right circumstances where you are destroying the bubble, you can actually generate reactive species and you can do oxidation. And this, again, is not a conjecture. It is shown in the literature. You can search and you'll find a lot of references to chemistry being performed uh, using uh, nanobubbles. And a reference is mentioned below. Again, a great slide. So this is based on the observation. Again, a reference is mentioned below. That nanobubbles are, uh, they're bubbles, but they also behave like particles. You know, they're like, if you can imagine like a solid particle, and if I shoot that particle at a surface, it can dislodge things, okay? From purely a physical uh, means. But because they're also charged, what happens? They do interact with protein molecules, protein type surfaces, okay, which microbes have. And they could actually enter the biofilm and they could actually destroy the biofilm, uh, you know, make it loose. And if you have a flowing liquid, then you can dislodge the biofilm, okay, from the surface. And once the biofilm is dislodged, or if there are no, no biofilms to begin with, these nanobubbles, there's evidence to show that they can absorb on your surface, okay? And prevent, protect further biofouling, okay? So if the bubbles are already absorbed on the surface, these microbes come along, they're unable to form a biofilms. They may stick as individuals, but uh, they are not able to come together and form a, a continuous uh, biofilm, which is very hard to get rid of, actually. So this, so this slide kind of tells you, you know, the biofilms, because, uh, sorry, the nanobubbles, because of their charge, they're able to get in spaces which normal molecules may not be able to get into, okay? And then be because it acts like a particle, it can actually have a kind of a cleaning effect, a scouring effect, okay? So this has been observed not only in a biological kind of situations, but also in, so for example, there's a reference on uh, semiconductor cleaning using a jet of water which contains nanobubbles. Okay, so there's evidence that you can actually clean uh, surfaces of debris of smaller particles just because these nanobubbles can behave like solid particles. 
So again, this is one another slide you may want to take home. Uh, the beauty about the slide is it starts with nanobubbles and then you know certain characteristics of nanobubbles like surface charge, you have hydrophobic uh, property, the stability uh, as a gas inside uh, hard particle. Then from there, you can actually go radially outwards and you can say, okay, what can this do? Okay, for example, if you look at the ROX collapse um, um, the inner circle, then you say, okay, I have a reactive oxygen species which can do sanitation. Okay, can I supplement, for example, uh, traditional sanitizers like chlorine or porosytic acid? Okay, then you can uh, go further and say, can I clean without chemicals? Okay, so you can go radially outwards and then you can uh, get to a function. For example, this whole ROS behavior leads to this oxidation disinfection function. So from a property of the bubble, you can go to an application or a function that it performs, okay? So this is more like a map. If you go and say, okay, I wanna do oxidation, or let's say I wanna do clean chemistry. So you go to the outer ring and then you go inwards, okay? To find which property of the bubble contributes to clean chemistry. Or if you look at coagulation, you can go inwards and see which property of the bubble helps you do coagulation, okay? So that way, this slide is really a very beautiful slide uh, to not only learn, but actually it's like uh, a cheat sheet <laughs> where you kind of go in and find out how you can use nanobubbles for a certain application. So now I'm getting into briefly into applications. And I want to mention that these are very brief. And in future webinars, we'll actually we'll be diving deeper into specific applications in specific industries. Okay. So this is basically a snapshot to show you the yes, nanobubbles are working, they do have an effect. So this is a study you know, done in uh, Chile uh, looking at blueberries yield. Okay. So basically nanobubble water used for irrigation. And, and just a simple thing like that, just put nanobubbles in the water and use irrigation, you increase the output, you increase the harvest yield okay, of the fruit. Okay. And this is now being replicated so many times on our website, on the Molaire website. You can go and find, I don't know, tens and tens of uh, case studies okay, of various applications. So in the next one, I'm going to show you an application, algae control in a reservoir. Okay. You know how prolific algae are. Once they start growing, they just grow and just muck up the whole water and it doesn't look beautiful at all. But by introducing nanobubbles in the water, an amazing thing happens, okay? The algae is less effective. It cannot compete very well with the beneficial organism. So the, what the nanobubble water does, it helps the beneficial organism take up the nutrients, okay? Compete better for the nutrients that the algae would be eating and growing. So now those nutrients are no longer available, okay, to the algae and they don't grow, okay? So that is one mechanism. And there's also mechanisms around direct impact of nanobubbles through oxidation mechanism, perhaps, on the algae itself, okay, which would prevent or kill the algae. So the couple of mechanisms by which nanobubble water kind of uh, helps control uh, algae growth, okay? Uh, slide number 36, another example. Uh, this is an example from aquaculture uh, done at the uh, UMass, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Basically looking at uh, can uh, nanobubbles uh, control uh, the growth of um, uh, gr growth of uh, bacteria, okay, uh, called Vibrio. And this study, it was compared against uh, chlorine, uh, bleach, okay. And uh, let me see, there was some other things it was compared against. Anyway, it was compared against conventional sanitizers, okay. And the amazing result was that the nanobubble water was pretty good. It was as effective as the uh, conventional sanitizers in controlling uh, the uh, growth uh, of the of the microbe of the bacteria. Okay, so this goes back to the sanitation function, which is an oxidation function. Okay, so this tells you, you know, how how nanobubbles, uh, you know, works through oxidation. So uh, remember I was saying uh, how the nanobubbles are charged, they can absorb stuff, they can oxidize. So this is a great example where there are flavor molecules like geosim and MIB, 
uh, very, very low levels, like 50 parts per trillion uh, levels in clean water, but they, you can still smell them, okay? Uh, you can still taste them, I guess. They're flavor molecules. And nanobubbles are able to reduce it, okay? Either through adsorption on the surface of the bubbles, which then can be floated out, or by direct oxidation, that the nanobubbles would oxidize these molecules and there would no longer be flavor molecules that you can uh, smell or taste, okay? Um, so, okay, so I, I think I've covered, you know, basically I've given you snapshots of few applications. And as I said, in future webinars, we're going to dive deeper into specific applications, okay? But right now, uh, I'm in a slide where I've kind of little philosophical slide looking into the future, <clears throat> okay? What is the future of nanobubbles, okay? And we at Molaire, you know, believe it has a bright future, like, you know, 1,000 megawatts bright future. Okay, for nanobubbles, just because without adding chemicals, without doing too much of stuff in a very environmentally friendly, sustainable way, you can actually do stuff. You can actually change the property of the liquid. You can kill microbes. You can help precipitate uh, metals in mining, for example. You can do a lot of stuff which normally you think it requires a lot of chemistry. But these nanobubbles have a very strange way of guiding the chemistry, okay, and doing chemistry by itself, okay? So think of this way. It does chemistry itself, but it also can guide the chemistry. It can guide ionic reactions that happen, okay, inside the, inside the liquid. So the slogan we have, you know, at Molaire is wherever there is a liquid, there's a place for nanobubbles because these nanobubbles are uh, gas and liquid ag agnostic. You can put any gas in the form of nanobubbles into any liquid, okay? So we believe the future is very bright and, uh, and Molaire is actually, you know, in our tagline, we say advancing nanobubble technology. And we are advancing nanobubble technology, uh, not only the science, but technology in actual practical applications, okay? So... On our website, so these are various resources. If you go to our website, it's rich with all kinds of articles, all kinds of uh, case studies. Okay, you can contact us. You can email us. My email is going to be in the next few slides. You can email me uh, with any specific questions that I did not answer, did not get a chance to answer. So please do that. Okay. So, Raghi, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sahel. Yes, and I just want to iterate the same sentiments that we, you know, we definitely see a bright future with nanobubbles. We are, um, we're happy to collaborate with Moliere. Um, they've been a, a great partner for us. And just along those lines, um, we at Melbourne Palette also have our own resources should you want to know more about characterizing your nanobubbles. So we have our knowledge center um, that has a wealth of information on various platforms, webinars, tech notes, app notes, um, and so forth. There is the homepage for NanoSite um, as, it's, as a product range um, to learn more about that technology and its capabilities. Um, we also have a couple of white papers and application notes that are specific to nanobubble characterization by nanoparticle tracking analysis or NTA that is available with NanoSite. And then um, we also do have our Zetasizer um, product uh, website here. The current family, the new family of Zetasizer is called the Zetasizer Advanced Series. There is a wealth of information there. Um, and there is a blog that specific, specifically, discuss, specifically discusses the Zetasizer um, at, you know, in terms of characterization of nanobubbles as well. And should you want to learn more, we, um, about our, our capabilities, want to see the capabilities in action, whether it's an on-site demo um, or sample submission, um, please contact us. We're happy to discuss uh, discuss your research interests. We have um, a way to contact our sales. You can request a demo, or if you just are in that sort of budgetary uh, you know, period right now and you want to get a quote, we're happy to provide that as well. Um, I also want to take a moment to uh, mention the ISO committee that is specific to fine bubble technology. That is 
ISO TC281 um, it is roughly 10 years old. There have been 18 published standards and 14 that are currently under development. It provides um, good quality guidance and on the generation and usage of fine and ultra fine bubbles. Um, and this would include a number of factors, including the uh, you know method for storage and transport of <laughs> bubble water um, and other you know other work showing you know shower heads and environmental cleanup of soils and oxygenation oxygenation of water. Um, there are a number of countries that are involved in this uh, committee. Um, we also welcome those to join. Um, there's roughly about two meetings a year, um, and they help develop a lot of these standards for fine bubble technology. Um, with that, I also want to mention that Molière and, Molière and Malvern Political continue to work together. We will be, um, this is the first webinar in a series. Um, so this today was a wonderful introduction into nanobubbles and how they can be characterized. Um, but we will also be looking at specific applications in upcoming webinars where we will um, further discuss the agricultural industry on February 15th, surface water on April 12th, and we will also um, be looking at wastewater in June. That date is to be determined, but it will be, as soon as it is determined, we will be advertising it. So please look, stay tuned for those webinars. Um, you can register and, um, and, you know, um, and learn more then. Um, and then you also have our email addresses, should you have any discussion, uh, uh, questions for Sohail um, or myself, you can see those email addresses here on the screen. Um, we will also be sending a copy of these slides out to everybody where all the hyperlinks that are available in the slides will be accessible to you, whether it's the publications or the, the resources at the end of the presentation. Um, with that, I also want to just thank you for your time and attention. Um, and, you know, again, if you have any questions, please send your questions on to us or, or the uh, event uh, coordinators here. We thank you again for uh, Kathy Macchiarola and uh, Edgar Chamorro for coordinating um, this presentation. Um, and with that, I will end my part of the presentation. I would hand it off to Edgar or Kathy and Sohail for uh, any further comments. Thank you everyone for your time. All right, gentlemen, mm -hmm. fascinating presentation and the questions have been coming in fast and furious. There are nearly 60 questions, so we won't have time to answer all of them. What I'm going to do is ask a few of the more popular questions. And then I promise you, if you ask, <clears throat> question, we will do our best to get back to you offline. Uh, so Hale, how stable are nanobubbles? Hours, days, months? Uh, yeah, so uh, the quick answer is months, okay, but I have to qualify it. So you can generate nanobubbles in various environments, high salt solution, less in DI water, in tap water, in all kinds of environment, okay. But our normal conditions, what we call clean water, DI water, tap water, no other stuff, we have seen it for months. We have actually stopped counting uh, after a few months. So we know they're very stable. But in the literature, people have reported even like a year, okay, it being stable in, in a, let's say, in a glass uh, jar or something like that. So they're very stable. And of course, you can destroy them, okay, by putting this or that, okay. But taking those account, uh, taking those away, yes, they're very, very stable to months. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Ruggy, is the NTA method limited to the concentration of nanobubbles? Um, well, so the, I don't know if I fully understand the question, but the concentration of anything that's moving in Brownian motion, whether it's nanobubbles or anything alongside nanobubbles in solution, um, the, the concentration limits are going to be uh, around 10 to the sixth power particles uh, per mil or up to about 10 to, nine, 10 to the 10th particles per mil um, in terms of concentration limits. It's just a matter of good statistics at the end. And then if it's too concentrated, you might have, the software might have a hard time distinguishing the Brownian motion track of one particle from another and giving you discrete analysis on a particle by particle basis or nanobubble by nanobubble basis. 
Okay. Um, so Hale, what is the smallest scale of Moliere setup? Oh, so uh, so we are down to uh, uh, currently uh, uh, ten uh, gallons per minute uh, setup, but we have a number of products in the development which can even go much much lower. It can go to liters, you know, quantities. Okay. Uh, so, but those are based on different technologies. Okay, and we'd be bringing them to market in the near future. But as of today, I would say the lowest we have is ten. 10 okay. GPM. Um, is there any electrostatic effect during the nanobubbles production and this can affect to element relations between them or affect the element elimination by plant? The, uh, so, so the nanobubbles, because they're charged, let's say, and then you use for irrigation, it goes down into the soil. Okay. Yes, it can actually, uh, I had mentioned the word like a, tra uh, a traffic controller. It can actually uh, control the iron availability, iron movement in the soil, uh, in the soil, in the root zone. Okay. And that is actually one of the best uh, mechanisms hypothesized to explain the effect of nanobubbles on plant growth. Okay. Because they're able to channel the nutrients. Okay. Better. Okay. Through electrostatic mechanism. Yes. Okay, um, uh, Ruggie, how do you um, calibrate the NTA for the measurement of nanobubbles? So it's a first order um, technique. You don't have to calibrate the system prior to analysis. There is a verification uh, process uh, when the system is prepared, uh, you know, at, upon purchase. Um, and you can, you know, every once in a while, just check a 100 nanometer latex standard make sure it measures correctly, but it's nothing you have to do prior to every single time you run the instrument for it, um, your samples. Okay, so Hale, have you done any research on what size of bubble is better for specific applications, for example, for fish? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we've been using actually uh, nanobubbles, which would be, you know, 100, you know, two, below 200 uh, range uh, for aquaculture. Uh, studies, where uh, more than size, um, I believe the uh, the the amount of ox dissolved oxygen is very critical for fish. Certain fish only survive at a certain level of oxygen, and how you control that through the injection mechanism, the machine you use to introduce. Uh, the dependence on survivability on bubble size, that's a great question. Actually, I don't have a quick answer for you. Okay, something I have to look at to see if the survivability is dependent on bubble size. So honestly, I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, another question for you, Sahel. Um, nanobubbles, how much effect to pH level in the water? If effect to pH level, which side effect? This point is important for us since pH level is effects to element elimination and also controlling disease like bacteria or fungus. Right. So if I understood that correctly, uh, uh, which way uh, does the pH shift when you when you have nanobubbles? Yeah. So the the pH should uh, go down. So there's literature actually saying that if you start with like seven, you'd actually shift it towards more acidic. Okay, and I think it is because if remember this cloud of hydronium ions around the bubble I was describing. I think those are the ones that uh, lead to lowering of the uh, of the pH. Exactly what amount, of course, will depend on the population. How much? How many nanobubbles you had per ml? Okay, but there is literature. I think um, uh, you know. If, if I get your contact, I can send you some literature on that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Next question: um, Does freezing destroy nanobubbles? And related to that, does um, what happens to the nanobubbles when they go through a freeze thaw cycle? Yeah. Okay. So great question. Actually, freeze and fracture is actually one of the methods of verifying that they are nanobubbles. So what people have done is they've taken nanobubble water, frozen it, fractured it, and looked it under the transmission electron microscope. And they've seen like very nice spherical depressions. Okay. And that is actually one of the direct evidence, evidences of existence of nanobubbles. Yeah. So they would survive. Okay. Now, how many cycles can you go freeze and thought you would destroy them? I don't know the answer, but uh, you can freeze them Yes, and, and you can thaw them. We have actually done the thawing ourselves, and you can see them. 
uh, they're still alive. But only thing we don't know how many times you can do before you lose them. That I don't know. Okay. Raghi, um, using nanosite, can you distinguish between the nanobubbles and other solid part particles? So it will depend on the nature of those particles. So as I mentioned, there's a different, there's three different ways you can distinguish nanobubbles from other particles. One is by size. If you're to do some control studies and see that nanobubbles are going to be in a certain size range, then anything else that is in, not in that size range could potentially not be nanobubbles. The other would be it, um, if you're if you have nanobubbles of the same you know size as some other moiety that might be of a higher density and higher scattering efficiency, then you could look at relative light intensity. Um, and that would have to be a, a distinct di difference, such as the presence of metals or metal oxides that are of the same size as nanobubbles. And then the third way would be to look at fluorescence, as I described, where if your you know, viruses or bacteria that also might be in the water, as Sohel has described, nanobubbles being applied, if they are fluorescently, uh, if they're fluorescent, then you could put in a fluorescence filter, look at the subpopulation that is fluorescent, um, do that analysis, and then compare it to the total population that includes not only your fluorescent, you know, virus or bacteria, but your nanobubbles as well. Your nanobubbles aren't going to be fluorescent, but then you could do that profile comparison between the, the, the analysis with the fluorescence filter and without the fluorescence filter, and use that to compare. Um, you know, those two different populations. Okay. Uh, so, Hale, is there any possibility to convey or store hydrogen inside the bubble? Uh, you can make a hydrogen nanobubbles, yes. Now, uh, how much hydrogen you want to store? So, as I said, the amount of gas in the bubbles is actually not much compared to dissolved gas in the, uh, in the liquid. Uh, so, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, it may not, may not be useful. But making nanobubbles out of hydrogen, yes, absolutely. Uh, do you know the kilowatt per hour requirement per thousand gallons of nanobubble water produced? Oh, so this is a question I think we should, uh, we have people who know that answer, okay? And uh, so uh, so if the, um, uh, the person who asked the question, uh, if they're contact, we could have, connect them with the right yes, person. Yes, we, we have the contact, yes. Okay. Um, do micro bubbles have the same properties and uses as the nanobubbles? Uh, do um, the... Uh, uh, they have the same properties, yes, in terms of, you know, the charges and all the surface and all, okay, stability, okay, not able to float up. Yes, they have. But the thing is, uh, the use, for example, in, in, in many cleaning applications in literature, you see a lot of uh, use of micro bubbles for cleaning, okay? For example, in flotation, there's a lot of use of micro bubbles. So depending on the application, you may have to tune your size. Uh, do I want a pure uh, micro, like one, two micron size, or do I need nanobubbles, or do I need a mixture? Okay. So in different applications, you may have to tune the uh, ratio of these sizes, but they do have distinct, uh, different applications. Yeah. Um, how do nanobubbles behave in boiling water? Uh, okay. Uh, does it survive boiling water? Uh, you know, I don't want to say yes or no. We've done some experiments off the cuff, as they say, oh, let's try something. They do survive actually high temperatures, you know, 90 degrees C, something like that, um, up to in the boiling. They do survive, okay? Uh, but, um, yeah, let me say let me say this. If they do survive. There's evidence that they survive, okay? Uh, and what else they do after that? If you have rigorous boiling, I don't know, but I can approach the temperature of boiling and still see they exist. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. We've had so many questions. Um, we will get back to, um, to people with their questions. I want to um, thank our speakers for this um, excellent presentation today and thank our audience for uh, really being a part of it and asking lots of questions. Gentlemen, would you like to say um, uh, something to our audience? Um, oh, okay. You know, I, I really want to thank him. You know, having people listen to you is a privilege. <laughs> it's a, really, it's an honor. So hopefully people got something out of it. Okay. And, uh, and we'll continue the series and educate the whole world about nanobubbles and what they can do. 
Yeah, and again, I just want to thank everybody um, for your attendance, your questions. Um, and again, thank you again to um, Moliere and Sohail for partnering with us in this webinar series. We look forward to the further uh, webinars. And again, to Kathy and Edgar for coordinating this uh, webinar today. We appreciate your time and effort, um, and we look forward to seeing you again in February when we have our next webinar. All right, great. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to all. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Yeah, bye then. Bye.